Hi, it's Rich here. This week we're going to talk about generative AI, student learning, and teacher productivity. I was asked by a family member to help their teenager with their Macbeth writing assignment for English grade 12, and let's call them Pat. And I quickly found out that Pat hated Shakespeare, but the Macbeth assignment was big enough that they had to complete it with a passing grade in order to graduate at the end of the term. Uh, the assignment, unfortunately, didn't come with learning objectives, at least what was given to Pat. But the instructions that Pat had seemed to indicate that the purpose of the assignment was to improve their comprehension skills, I think probably their writing skills, given the nature of the course, and maybe help them develop an appreciation for Shakespeare, which it didn't seem to be doing, unfortunately. So I gave Pat some substantial one-on-one -on -one support, helped them to help them complete the reading assignment. And you could see that they were visibly relieved when the paper was ready to be submitted. When Pat got their grade back, it was a C plus, which they were more than happy with. Although I have to admit that I was a little bit put out because given all the help that I gave them, uh, I suspected that the grade probably should have been, you know, a B or an A minus. Uh, but we'll talk about uh, teacher bias on another day. I wish I could have helped Pat approach their teacher to see or to talk about the learning objectives for the course to see if maybe another topic could have achieved the learning objectives. But that said, uh, given today's topic of generative AI and student learning, I'm wondering if generative AI might have been helpful for Pat's teacher to help them create a different topic that would have met the learning objectives in a slightly different way. Uh, generative AI wasn't an option then, but if it was, I wonder if we can think of any ways that generative AI could help them, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. This was my first attempt at using generative AI back in December of 2022, and I'll just get us out of the the uh, animated GIF so you can read it a little more easily. Uh, the topic that I put in there is pretty niche, but it's something that I know quite a bit about because I'd just written a paper, finished writing a paper, and it had been published just before December 2022. And I was shocked at how good the answer was. Um, it was arguably as good as the abstract that I'd written myself for the journal article. And I was really wondering what uh, we were going to do in education, especially higher education, given how good the response was. But I quickly discovered that while it did an excellent job at that particular uh, prompt, it doesn't always do that good of a job. So for example, back in January of 2024, uh, there was a news report about a lawyer in Vancouver who, who used ChatGPT to help them create legal document for a, uh, I believe it was a divorce case that they were working on. Uh, it created quite a good brief that supported the arguments that the lawyer was making, uh, so they submitted it to the court. The lawyers on the other side of the case were looking at the, uh, at the brief and recognized the uh, legal cases that were cited, but didn't recognize the quotes. So they went to the legal briefs and could not find five of these uh, quotes that uh, the person included in the article, or I should say chat GPT included in their, their brief. Uh, so the lawyer asked the, the, uh, or the, the judge asked the lawyer who'd created the brief if they could point them in the direction of the quotes because no one could find them. And at that point, the lawyer admitted that they'd used ChatGPT to create the brief. And eventually, the judge ordered the lawyer to pay several thousand dollars to the other lawyers to compensate them for the time they spent trying to find these uh, made-up quotes. Suffice to say, uh, generative AI tools will not infrequently make things up. So that's something that we all need to be aware of. So before we go any deeper, I just want to do a quick overview of artificial intelligence so we all are on the same page in terms of the language we're using. And as you uh, might have guessed from the uh, story about the lawyer, uh, generative AIs are not intelligent. They are word and sentence and paragraph prediction machines. And they do a really good job, but 
They are not built for fact-finding or for reproducing facts. Uh, this diagram helps situate situates where generative AI lives in the larger artificial intelligence ecosystem. As you can see here, we have narrow artificial intelligence, we have machine learning here, natural language processing, and large language models, which are pretty much power generative AI, are at the intersection of machine learning and natural language processing. And large language models power tools like MetaAI, Gemini, Copilot, and ChatGPT, which has been around the longest. But we've been using generative AI for years now. Uh, probably the easiest example I can cite is the keyboard on our phones. It uses generative AI, a lightweight version of generative AI, to try to predict what we're going to type next in order to help us be more efficient in entering uh, data or, and words in particular on our phones. And this diagram is a massive oversimplification, but at its core, this is generally speaking what large language models and generative AI is doing. They're trying to predict the next word or sentence or paragraph. So if I type in the, maybe there's a 40% chance that red comes next or a 60% chance of cat, and then so on down. And again, it does this not only at the word level, but at the paragraph and sentence level to try to predict what is coming next. Uh, given the uh, the prompt that we've given it. And it does this using statistical models and huge, huge, huge data sets uh, of data that it's primarily, or that they primarily have uh, scraped or acquired from across the internet or the web. And fortunately, current general purpose Gen AI models like ChatGPT are a lot like over, over eager and overconfident in systems who will make up plausible sounding responses, including fake quotes, as that lawyer found out, from experts in a field, as well as sometimes fake citations in order to fulfill your request. In the case of the lawyer, it made up the quotations, but they were actually real uh, court cases that it was citing. So let's explore some use cases for generative AI or potential use cases for generative AI in K-12 classes. Uh, one of them is lesson plan generation. Uh, this can be hugely helpful as a time saver for you as a teacher. Uh, and as you can see here, I've asked uh, Gemini to create an outline for an eight week, twice a week class on the British Columbia Physical Literacy Standards for grade three learners. And you can see it's got a high level day-by-day um, -day outline of what would be covered. So I followed that up with a requesting a detailed lesson plan for week one, day one. And it created a pretty good lesson plan. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind is you need to know what is actually in the, uh, the literacy standard for that particular grade so that you can look at the overall outline as well as detailed lesson plans to make sure that it's actually uh, following what's in that uh, in the standard. Um, if you don't know what's in the standard, you should probably go to the standard just to verify that what it's suggesting you do aligns with the standard. Another thing you do is just create educational content. Uh, so this example is uh, just a question. Did Canadians set fire to the White House in the War of 1812? It come back, came back with a response as well as a, a citation for it. So you could verify that it's actually accurately representing history. Uh, another thing you could do is maybe create a game. Um, in this case, create a Jeopardy board for different ways children can act to be more environmentally friendly. Uh, using a grade five vocabulary. Again, we need to be uh, either subject area experts in the things that we're asking it to do so we can verify that it's not uh, including any inaccuracies in the uh, in what it's telling us about the War of 1812 in the one example or about being envir uh, environmentally friendly. Uh, but again, these can be huge time savers, even if they do introduce some inaccuracies. If you're a subject area expert, it's pretty easy to identify those and uh, fix them as needed. Another one would be giving feedback for writing. So maybe some of your students are doing some writing. Uh, 
You'll give them feedback as the instructor, but maybe as uh, a form of formative assessment, you could prompt them or ask them to use a generative AI tool to give them feedback. This is an example that I actually got uh, asked uh, Gemini to give me feedback on my writing, and it actually came back with some really good suggestions. Uh, I didn't adopt all of the suggestions, but some of them uh, prompted me to go back to my writing and make some modifications. Another potential thing you could do is have students pose an essential question, inquiry question, then ask them to research and evaluate the response that uh, ChatGPT or Gemini or other generative AI tool give them. Uh, in this case, they'd probably need to do some research to evaluate uh, the output from the generative AI tool. Another thing you can do, and I've seen this quite frequently, and this is probably what I would do, is prompt students to ask ChatGTP a problematic question or a question that you know that it would struggle with in order to easily find a way for students to see how sometimes ChatGPT will make things up. Again, you need to do some testing, and it's something you'd need to test before you had your students do that every time you did that, just to make sure that it didn't do a better job next year, for example, as opposed to the problematic response that it would give this year. So whether we like generative AI or dislike it, um, we really de do need to help our learners develop artificial intelligence literacies, along with general information literacy skills like we've been doing in the education field for years. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to do it. Again, even if we're discouraging our students from using generative AI, some of them will be using it, whether we approve of it or encourage it or not. So developing those literacies so they understand the strengths uh, and the, as well as the limitations of generative AI are really important so that they don't get themselves into trouble inadvertently because they don't understand what it is good for and what it does not do as well. So another key part of those literacies are uh, ethical considerations. A big one is data privacy. Uh, teachers should be mindful of the data collected and used by generative AI tools, either through you using it for uh, productivity purposes, for helping you create lesson plans and things like that. For example, sensitive student information shouldn't be, uh, be put into any of the generative AI tools. Uh, and if, if you are doing that, you need to make sure that the school board uh, privacy uh, policies or the provincial privacy policies are respected. And if your students are using it, they should be made aware that data that they input into uh, generative ad tools might be used as um, training data and uh, be exposed as output to other people that are putting in queries. And really, we should be encouraging them not to put any personally identifiable information for themselves or anyone else into generative AI tools. Bias is another big issue. Uh, generative AI tools use the web for training data primarily. So biases on the internet or the web are going to be reflected in the responses to prompts that we put into the generative AI tools. Uh, so for example, um, if we uh, put in a, a prompt for, uh, for an image of three CEOs, we might get something like this, which might be representative, but maybe we're thinking of CEOs in China in or Taiwan, in which case we should put that into our prompt so that we get something that's more reflective of the reality that we're, uh, we're trying to represent and for whatever purpose we want to use the image. A couple of uh, biases in the literature are for the global north as well as English language. So again, depending on what we're trying to do or what we're asking the generative AI tool to do, we need to be aware of that and maybe modify our prompts so that we get a representation uh, that reflects what we're looking for. Another thing we need to be mindful of is if we're asking our students to use generative AI tools, we need to make sure that, especially if it, as a homework, that we're mindful that maybe not everyone has access to computers or the internet in the same way that we do as instructors. So uh, again, you might want to limit those assignments to in-class where we know that we can provide people with 
tablets or laptops uh, in order to do those types of assignments. Another issue that's been raised, and may I'm not sure how much study has been done on it yet, but uh, we should probably at very least be mindful that uh, we don't want to shortcut the learning process for things like critical thinking and problem-solving skills by having our students use generative AI tools all the time. Um, again, if our learning objective is critical thinking, uh, uh, we should structure our assignments in a way so that generative AI isn't very helpful in the assignment or have our students critically evaluate the outputs of generative AI tools, uh, in which case we could maybe provide them with the output of generative AI so that they don't have to use it on their own necessarily. And also we need to make sure that learners understand the importance of human judgment and the value of humans interpreting uh, and evaluating the outputs of generative AI. As educators, uh, something that we might be tempted to do is use generative AI tools to help in grading assignments. Uh, there are some definite pros and cons to doing that. Uh, but you should know that at the University of Victoria, by policy, instructors are not allowed to use generative AI uh, for grading assignments. Uh, I suspect that one of the major reasons for that is hallucination. It may do an okay job some of the time, or maybe even most of the time, but that cannot be dependent upon. So uh, at UVic, we can't use generative AI tools for assessment, and I suspect that most school districts across British Columbia uh, have the same types of policies. So you should check with your uh, district IT coordinator or similar position to make sure uh, or to see what the policy is. And I suspect it will be not to use uh, Gen AI for grading. There's also a significant environmental impact to using generative AI tools uh, or training generative AI models it uses a huge amount of electricity. Um, the queries that we make to the generative AI tools also use electricity, not nearly as much, but it does add up. Uh, so that's something we should be mindful of. I suspect just because of economic incentives uh, that uh, the big generative AI vendors are working on ways to reduce the amount of electricity, but currently it is a lot of electricity that's used and we should be mindful of that and make sure we communicate that to our learners. Uh, one of the ways I think that they will eventually be able to reduce the amount of electricity used in generating models is uh, by developing smaller model models. And currently, if they generate a new model, they have to generate every model from scratch. Uh, I suspect that they will eventually be able to use a, an additive um, uh, technology or technique to generate new models so that they're not generating from scratch, but they're adding to the model that isn't uh, in a way that doesn't use as much energy. Um, so going back to the Macbeth assignment at the very beginning that we talked about, that uh, Pat's Macbeth assignment. Um, so what do you think now? Uh, could generative AI have helped Pat's teacher more easily customize the Macbeth assignment uh, to hopefully use a topic that was more interesting to Pat? And now that we've covered a little bit of this, and after you've gone through the active learning activities, uh, or maybe once you finish those active learning activities in a few minutes, think back to how you could maybe use generative AI tools to help learners who maybe really aren't interested in the topics meet the learning objectives for the, the course or for the, uh, the activity or the assignment, uh, but using something, a topic that maybe speaks to them that a little bit more, uh, stronger or that they're more passionate about. Anyways, I hope you have found this, uh, this activity useful today and hope you find the active learning activities below useful as well. Take care. Bye-bye.